How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. In 2012, the 100,000 Genomes Project was announced. And fun fact, that's actually the year that we started DNA Today. Um, But then back in 2005, we did an episode about the 100,000 Genomes Project. So I'm really excited to revisit this massive project today with guest Dr. Julian Barwell, who is a clinical geneticist and has countless titles, but I'm going to focus on the most relevant title today, which is as the operational clinical lead of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Barwell. I'm super pumped to jump into the 100,000 Genomes Project with you. Thank you so much for having me, me on. I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm very happy to go through it with you. Yeah, because it's crazy that it's been 10 years. That is such a long time in genetics. So for those that aren't familiar, maybe weren't listening to our show, you know, seven years ago, what is the 100,000 Genomes Project? What's your elevator pitch when you're at a party and someone's like, what do you do for a living? And once you explain like, oh, genetics and all that, and then you say the project, how do you explain it to people? What were like the aims of the project? Sure. So this is really an Olympic legacy project. So it came out of the London 2012, really. And it was really a kickstart for thinking about genomic medicine here in the UK. So what they wanted to do was to look at rare diseases, but also people with common and sometimes rarer cancers as well. And actually see if we're going to do whole genome sequencing, what could be the benefit? Now, the problem with whole genome sequencing, if you go back to 2012, was first of all, it took a long time to get the results. Secondly, you create all this huge amount of data and we all have so many genomic variants, which might be important. Actually, how do you work out what actually is going to be important for that individual patient? And there was a great concern about standardization so thinking about the criteria who to test what to test for thinking about how to consent patients thinking when you're collecting samples and they were looking at people with rare disease but also with tumors whether or not to collect samples from the parents as well as a comparison whether or not to go for fresh tumor or to do paraffin embedded blocks how to collect the clinical data which is absolutely key for the patient and also then when you get those results through how do you look at databasing as well so that you call those variants effectively but then there's a final concept which i think people often forget which is the collaboration aspect so how do you involve the patient in that journey because data is key data is going to be one of the currencies of the 21st century alongside fresh water, I think. Um, And if something's for for free, I often think then we are the currency. Um, Our data is the currency. So um, there's the data and the patient, but there's also collaboration with clinicians to take them on the journey, which is absolutely key outside of clinical genetics, but also when we're thinking about commercial companies and so that they can start to think about when you're looking at particular genomic variants, how can we track that to patient outcomes when it comes particularly for pharmaceuticals, but also research groups as well. Because we all have all these genomic variants, it can be difficult to know which one's actually important. Um, And so it's the ability to collaborate and bring those different groups together, which is quite a unique part of this project rather than purely gene mapping. So hopefully that's a bit of a start. It's looking at people with rare diseases and it's trying to find tumor drivers, which might be amenable to treatment in patients. But it's trying to look at all the different challenges when you're dealing with big data. And it's really like basic 
level research in the sense of like you're not necessarily looking like we're looking at this certain condition you're collecting so much information so that other researchers and everything can use this as a resource so it's you're touching so many areas as you said you're focusing on rare diseases and cancer is, is being that but looking at you know especially rare diseases we can learn so much about human health from that to see you know what are differences and oh this person's body works a little bit differently what can we learn about the human body and genetics role in that from this disease um so it's it's just such a wide encompassing project and the recruitment for the project was actually completed in december 2018 who was originally eligible to have their genome sequence was it just rare disease patients and uh patients that had cancer i mean did you also include um you know quote unquote healthy typical patients as well that didn't really have a specific clinical background that you were looking at to have almost as like a baseline to say this is you know what um a healthy genome would look like no it, w it wasn't for people who don't have a rare disease or um, a tumor it, but it was looking at like for instance children with a rare disease and their parents to see if you could find a variant which was perhaps de novo so occurring for the first time in the child and not present in the in the parents with very careful phenotyping as well to then be able to look at those variants and and i always say if you've got six fingers on one hand what the ability is if you then find a variant in a patient you'll then be able to look at all the patients who have got six fingers on one hand but also look at all of the people who have got the variants that you're interested in and see if they've got six fingers so it's the ability to look both ways with the phenotyping which is key so it was only for people with very specific diagnosis and interestingly one of the really great things that came out of the project was a much greater understanding of who to test what the criteria were for testing but crucially what for so whether whole genome sequencing is the way to go or dedicated gene panels so there was a group of intellectuals uh, and medics that were able to look at the criteria for any given of um, um, indication and there were hundreds of pages of, of, of indications so we came up with an, uh, a concept called genome wheels which was criteria so that a cardiologist um, would be able to just look at two or three pictures which would have all of their criteria rather than trying to wade through several hundred pages and they could just put it up on their on their clinic um, because this is about trying to engage secondary care so engaging those hospital doctors looking after people with cardiomyopathy or or um, severe combined immunodeficiency or, or respiratory disease whatever whatever it is but it's very much about building the framework the framework around consent sample collection databasing and as i said identifying which patients to test with which type of technology that's come out of it now the criteria was difficult because they were looking for people who didn't have a diagnosis so you had to have a clear medical diagnosis and i think this is still absolutely key for whole genome sequencing you want people who have a clear medical problem it's you can't just say i'm not feeling very well let's just do some genomics but if you include a clear diagnosis then those patients had the chance to take part but only if you couldn't find a gene so it was very much a gene mapping exercise as well so that did slow it up so it did take time the other approach you could have taken is just say look we'll just sort out cardiology we'll look at the arrhythmias we'll look at the cardiomyopathies we'll look at congenital heart disease and go from there but they didn't do that they went much bolder and said we want to get learning across the whole of the healthcare system we didn't include primary care for general practice but they did include people with rare diseases um, and the, the idea of build, starting to build that database really and as you highlighted, it's so important to take the phenotypic data of what a patient has, like you use the example of like, if you have, you know, an extra finger um, of looking at, okay, that's their phenotype, that's their information, their medical history, really, and then looking at, all right, can we find the cause of that in the genome? Did you also look at family medical history and span out a little bit past the patient? Because I'm thinking, you know, as a genetic counselor, obviously, you know, that's what I, I do a lot of the time. I'm constantly taking pedigrees of family history. Um, were you focused on that part, too? 
Yeah, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So we had a family where there had been six members of the family diagnosed with breast cancer. A number had had BRCA and PALB2 testing. We hadn't found anything and we had three sisters who'd had breast cancer within 13 months and, and we had failed to make a diagnosis. So we included them um, and in fact two of them had a PALB2 gene alteration which is a breast and ovarian susceptibility and well, in fact we tested other members of the family and classically in the past we would have come up with a paradigm you've tested two people for it it won't be that so i think one of the things about genomics is it does test some of your paradigms that you're taught at medical school so for instance don't look for a second diagnosis if only one will do well actually through genomics, we've found there are some people who get a second diagnosis. Sometimes we got to think zebra, not horse, like we're taught in medical yeah, school, right? Yeah, uh, it, 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 that, does, that does happen. And, and we wouldn't have gone looking in the past for, for that. But also that, that crucially looking into the wider family history and getting a really clear phenotype. I had a girl 19 years old with, with autism and learning difficulty, but relatively mild actually, but no clear family history. But it was the fact, having spoken, you know, gone to the family's house and we sat down and we talked about the, the issues that this girl had had for about an hour. And it was the dyspraxia which had come out. And, and that, when, it, when we found a de novo change in a gene, and that gene had learning difficulties, autism and dyspraxia, it was able to then go, yes, this phenotype is now actually more specific. So what's actually going on with this patient really does fit with the case reports. And then when that family were able to then look at those case reports, they were able to say, yes, we can see the similarities with what's going on. So you know, a family that had gone 19 years without a, um, a diagnosis, we, we talk about diagnostic odysseys and, and perhaps in neurometabolic process, the average is six years. But of course, many families have gone decades without getting a diagnosis. And, and that may be difficult in terms of that sense of, well, why has this happened? Is it something that I, have, that I did in pregnancy? Um, or is it something um, in the environment? Um, and that can be helpful, as well as providing recurrence risk for the family or, or, or potentially things to, to screen for in the future or disability living allowance, for instance. So they're really nice when you can get those, those extra diagnoses. There's so many aspects that go into being able to have a diagnosis, like you said, of, of what's the risk for future pregnancies, that recurrence risk. Um, is there any treatments or, you know, certain therapies that's really helpful for that person? Is there any clinical trials? I mean, the list is like endless. Um, so it's definitely frustrating for um, families I've talked to and interviewed on the show that have gone so long on that diagnostic odyssey and to finally get that answer. And sometimes it's after a misdiagnosis, which is really unfortunate as well. But, you know, looking at all of this, I mean, this is a lot of data to be processing. Not only is it the genomic data, which we'll kind of get into, but also all of this patient and family history information. I mean, did you use digital pedigrees to keep track of all of this? Yes. So digital pedigrees are going to be really important moving forward because as we move to mainstreaming, so the, the, the idea that we democratize genetics, because very much in the past, the clinical geneticist sat in the corner of the room and tried to make a cl clever diagnosis by 5 p.m. That was the, the genetic, you know, I read this paper in, in, in from 1984 of this child that had a very similar facial feature. And therefore we should go for this gene because gene tests took years. So, and were expensive. Um, and because of the challenges um, with finding subtle variants in genes. So, so there is this concept that perhaps there will be a change in the order because in the past we've gone history, examination, family history and consideration for test. It is possible, particularly in cancer, for instance, that some of that ordering may be reversed and actually the molecular testing might be earlier on in the piece. And then later on we're saying, well, does it match? I do think it's important to be aware, though, that a lot of people still don't have a diagnosis and how do they feel? We can tell them what it isn't 
and some of those that can be useful information particularly if it goes into computer modeling and that's another advantage of the the phenotyping and and having a really good digital pedigree because once you've got a digital pedigree you can add it to computer modeling and you've got the governance so that if you've got a pediatrician filling it in or an oncologist then other people will be able to review it plus when you put in that data about the six finger or that unusual histology you can always pull up all the families that have that so That's the so ability helpful. to go back and actually look at those family trees for people who have novel data because this is not a pure physical science and when you're dealing with biological science new data emerges that changes your understanding of that variant so it is important that we are humble when we're talking to patients about the significance of the variants that we detect particularly the subtle missense variants um, because new information may come to light as other patients are included or we're able to track variants within family or functional data becomes available where we're able to look at the the impact of that gene change um, and i think it's really important that we don't just say what we think we need to start moving into medicine where we start to give confidence intervals around that so it's no longer yes or no it's i think it's yes and i'm 95 percent certain and everything in genetics is a spectrum, even even it, how we yes. explain things. It is very difficult, though, for patients who are used to a much more binomial paternalistic model. And if the patient sees that you have doubt, then that can be very difficult for patients. So I think we're going to have to work very carefully with patients, not only on data and how their data is collected and stored and used but also the downstream rationing and of course people are worried if you fill in a family tree well of course your first cousin once removed hasn't provided any consent for that so there, there's all sorts of issues in the UK and in Europe we've got GDPR so which is about how your data is stored so but it's not just about the storage there's also well in the long run there may be downstream decisions about your screening or about the drug you might be able to access based on this data so how do people actually feel about their data being used in that way so that participation aspect is going to be really important but with regards to pedigree it helps us obviously to be able to share that information between secondary care and the genetics departments it helps us to be able to do computer modeling to clarify risk, particularly important if we don't find a gene change. But it also helps us to do those searches, searches for people with that gene change or searches of people with that particular phenotype. And, and those are the three reasons why it's particularly helpful. Of course, you can add additional um, family members and information as time goes on um, and modeling, which you couldn't do on it if you were just dealing with paper. Yeah, it is nice just to be able to add like, oh, we're now making updates, you know, a baby was born or some, someone else has been introduced into the family in, in some way. And, you know, one thing I think about in terms of like, as we look at the future um, and using this database and everything from the 100,000 Genomes Project, I mean, are you looking to make any upgrades to pedigree tools um, like track genes? Yes. So what we would like to be able to do is for starters, help patients to be able to fill in information online so that rather than sending a paper copy, that actually patients can start um, completing the, the, the pedigree themselves. Um, so when they are referred, they can go online. The second thing we'd like to do is, is change the emphasis as to who holds the data. So what I'm a great believer in that the patient should hold the data and give permission for me to be able to access it and that's particularly important for these people who are dealing with conditions like von hippel lindau for instance which may affect the eyes the brain the kidney tract system the hormonal system um, as well so they may be seeing lots of different special specialists in different hospitals very difficult if you if they, if each hospital has their own record so we want patients to be able to hold that information but also we want to develop systems where people can have their own clinical dashboard so for instance in von hippel lindau syndrome 
it would be have they had their blood pressure checked have they had a kidney scan where are they at with their hormonal review where are they at with their brain scan and their eye reviews for retinal angiomas to make sure they don't get um, blindness in the longer term so and you can red amber green that and then once you but and of course once it's digitalized you then have the opportunity to audit how is the patient being managed and offer reminders as to when their appointments are and crucially because we don't follow up all of our patients you can give them updates so if the criteria change changes or a new research out um, um, comes along that suggests perhaps you should be able to take this drug then unless you're following up all your patients it might be very difficult to have that relationship with the patient so I think the digitalization needs to be both ways it needs to be not only that we can see what's going on with the patient but we can also give back to the patient when information relevant to them comes along so we can reach out to all of our BRCA carriers or or Lynch syndrome in one go um, and I always worry about the, the patient that turns up with a rare disease on a dark Friday night in a busy accident and emergency department um, and they say I'm struggling with dizziness and I've got palpitations um, and they've got von Hippel Lindau and they've got a, a brain tumor or a, or a pheochromocytoma but the doctor or the physician doesn't know about the condition and just says oh I'm sure it's nothing so if patient it's about patient empowerment and I say if your health is like being on an airplane are you the pilot are you the steward or hostess or are you the passenger and are you gonna let your airplane just crash and of course the answer is you need to be able to be at least a steward um, or the hostess particularly if you have these rare conditions so I see digitalization is not the only answer and not for taking away having a clinical champion but I see that as a very useful tool useful in terms of our governance and where how we hold information but also to help our patients um, to keep them on the straight and narrow with regards to their appointments if they want and, and a quick clinical overview but also those updates in the longer term obviously people should have the ability to switch the app these these systems off and and have them only when they need them because they we don't want them to be intrusive um, and I think work needs to be done around that because psychologically it's a bit like having a car most of the days you just want to be able to drive you don't want to think about when its next checkup is due or it might break down you just want to crack on and it's the same with our patients I don't want our patients to feel sick every day I want them for 360 days a year to just crack on with their lives um, but when they do need us we want to have systems that will help them and digitalization really allows patients to be a partner in research which I think was one of the goals of this project to be able to have patients have much more autonomy in their healthcare as you're talking about to be that stewardess that hostess um one aspect that i was curious about is you know it's very important to have genomes from various ancestries represented um so you had a collaboration with um, the center for ethnic health to recruit people within the african caribbean community um, how how did this work? I mean, with this, were you able to hit the 100,000 genomes goal? I mean, that's a lot of genomes that we're talking about. I remember when I heard about this 10 years ago, I was like, it's going to take them forever to do that. So I don't know. How did, how did this work in terms of getting, you know, this amount of people and, and the representation from different ethnicities? And were you able to hit the goal? Yes. So they, they did hit the goal and they did wow. hit the, the ethnic um um, breakdown that they were they were looking at so the the sort of things that we did was reach out into the community so we've been on uh, radio stations so Asian network for instance for uh, men of African descent we went to um, events and we put on events for instance where they play dominoes because in, in, in our culture, a lot of men from 
um, with that descent, like to, to to meet up and play dominoes, and we we go talking at sporting venues, so at at football clubs, sorry, soccer clubs. Um, no, say where football. We... The Americans can catch up. It's fine. <laughs> We've all watched Ted Lasso, so I think we're used to it by now. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, we call it taking medicine to the to the people. So we go out on on battle buses. We've used local celebrities. We've used local members of the community in our videos for instance we've used members of our staff that come from these communities um, as well it, it, it basically requires a number of different types of approaches what it comes down to is i think two things so one is trust you've got to listen to the community because in the past to be honest genetics has had problems with the way that research is being carried out and issues of stigmatization. And people are worried about how genetic results are used, particularly from some of these communities. So trust and listening and true involvement and not tokenism is so important um, when it comes to this. The second one, of course, apart from trust, is how do you actually make sure you frame it whereby people can see the benefit. So at the beginning, of course, there's the benefit through the project of can you make a diagnosis which might help the family, the patient and the family, but also can we truly feel that people are involved? So there's two issues here in terms of ethnicity. One is biological, which is unless you get true representation, it will be very difficult to understand genomic variants in that population. And for instance, this is crucial for pharmacogenetics. So in Leicester, where we are, we have a very big South Asian community. You look at, like, uh, at a drug like clopidogrel. I know this was an issue on Hawaii, for instance. A lot of people who take clopidogrel, which is to stop blood clots, particularly around stents, a lot of people, the drug just doesn't work. You don't know, you don't have any side effects, but it just doesn't work. So there's a risk of a stroke. So we need to get away from the idea of standard treatment. And I hope that in 20 years time, we'll look back at October 2022 and say, what on earth were we doing? Giving everybody the same drug. That was like giving them leeches in the original Les Elizabethan era, um, bloodletting and that, and that what, you know, you can't treat everybody with the same drug at the same dose. And I think we're getting close to that time where people will really see the benefit, not just the benefit of doing pharmacogenetic, but say, you, how can you not do it? And I think we're getting close to that point. So there's an implementation challenge there of who owns it, how do we get it up and running? How do we get the education right? Because the education and training and logistics is so important. But also we need to get a point where it's easy it needs to be quick and easy, and these answers need to be available to a busy clinician. And I would say you've got 90 seconds. So if something isn't available in 90 seconds, then people will start to lose interest because everyone is just so clinically busy, um, particularly in primary and secondary care. So we need this, this sort of data will game change how we think about genomics. But there's still a lot of work to be done with regards to how is it implemented. Oh, I think that's certainly the case. And you captured it well, really well that I think in the next 10, 20 years, personalized medicine, we talk about that so much in genetics, but I think it's really going to leak out to all these other specialties. And it's just that it's not going to be a buzzword in genetics anymore. It's just going to be a buzzword in healthcare, and that, you know, genetics plays a role in so much. It's the base of really everything in in health conditions. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that other fields are catching up to this, just like you said, especially with pharmacogenomics. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, it was so rudimentary, you know, it was really more screening. And now I feel like we're, we're leaning more towards testing with it, which is really exciting. 
Um, but I, I think those will probably be the biggest changes in genetic testing over the next couple of years too, is in that pharmacogenomic space as we learn so much more about this, especially I think, you know, you have such a huge database with a hundred thousand genomes. I mean, that's like insane when you think about the numbers, like my brain, my little brain can't even comprehend, you know, how much that is. But, you know, it's, I, I'm so sad that we're running out of time because I feel like I could talk to you for another, you know, three hours. But I think my last question would be, how is the 100,000 Genomes Project going to change the role of genetic counselors? So as you know, I'm a genetic counselor, so I, you know, I've got to ask about that. And, and my, my fellow genetic counselors, there's about 5,000 of us in the United States. Um, but you know, we start talking about the rest of the world, a good, good chunk of us. So, Well, I, I like to think of clinical genetics, personalized medicine, and genomics is sort of two interlinking circles, like a Venn diagram. So you've got your classic Mendelian genetics, and on the other side, you've got genomics. And for me, genomics is not whole genome sequencing. It's really integrated data science. It's can you bring together the power, not only of your DNA code, but your postcode. Can we integrate that with whole genome sequencing, with SNPs? Can you bring together that family history data from your digitalized system? and your pathology data, and your radiology data, and your Fitbit, and your sleep app, and your health outcome measures. And crucially, can we link that to healthcare outcomes to generate an equation for life? So that's, that's the direction of travel. And so I see clinical genetics as understanding the past. It's stargazing, it's, it explains the past, that's fine. When you're trying to think about predicting response, to a treatment, that's the intersection, that's the personalized medicine bit. So that's looking at your SNPs, it's looking at your Galeri test, looking at methylation patterns from cell-free DNA, it's looking at your tumor genetics, your microbiology, your pharmacogenetics, and that's predicting response. But actually, when you're thinking about risk moving forward, that's where genomics comes in, because I think where we struggle is we often think of genetics as prediction, whereas actually it's giving us reason for the past. So I think we the danger is over extrapolation here of data. Genetics explains how we got here. My oldest gene is two billion years old, and this is the best body could come up with. Anyway, so it it's a it's a marker of the past, genetics. Whereas when am I going to develop breast cancer? That requires genomics, cell-free DNA, looking at risk modifier genes, looking at my body mass index, looking at my family history, putting in computer modeling, potentially AI as well. So we can look more agnostically at the data, big data, bringing big data sets together. So, you're, so to answer the question regarding genetic counselors, you're going to have more patients with data there's going to be more variants which will be unclear and you won't know what to do with. So there will be a balance between complexity and uncertainty, but we need to be still very humble when it comes to thinking about what does this mean with regards to my brain aneurysm, family history as to should I get a scan, when do I get um, uh, um, actually an aneurysm, does it need an intervention? That's where we need all that data bringing together. So it, there are huge opportunities to identify people potentially with high cholesterol or who might develop a cardiomyopathy, but there is also that risk of over-medicalizing people, overly worrying people, stigmatizing people. Gosh, I mustn't do exercise because I've got this subtle variant in this cardiomyopathy gene or a connective tissue gene. There is a risk of harm. So we need to balance the results within the framework of the patient, their understanding, their experience of the disease and what they've read about it as well, and their wider health. So I think very much genetics has a role, but it's not everything.
it's not everything, but we certainly have our work cut out for us, I think. Absolutely. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Barwell, for coming on and just sharing so much of this insight. Um, for me, it was just so exciting to hear from you directly about the 100,000 Genomes Project. Never did I think seven years ago I would be interviewing you when I was just talking about it, you know, as like a news episode of DNA Today. So very exciting for me. And I wanted to recommend for listeners, like as we were talking about this, um, I thought about the book. I don't know if you've read it. The Patient Will See You Now. I think it's by Eric Topol. Um, it's a great book that's a few years old. And so I, I read it a few years ago and it really explores how the digital age is just changing healthcare. Cause it's the patient will see you now, not the doctor will see you now. That's the whole Absolutely. concept there. Um, and track gene is actually going to be giving away, um, 10 copies of this to listeners of the show, as well as a free, um, lifetime user for their pedigree building software. Um, and DNA Today listeners can also get 12 months free trial with code DNA Today. Um, so if you guys head over to our social media at DNA Today Podcast on all platforms, um, we're going to be posting giveaways. You guys can enter there. We're going to be posting it next week. Um, so definitely, you know, have, have this episode stay with you by uh, entering the giveaway there and everything. Um, but Dr. Barwell, thank you so much. I'd love to have you on again in the future because I feel like there's so much we can talk about. I have like thank endless questions for you, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you all to all the patients that took part and, and for everyone's interest today. It's hugely appreciated and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.